কোন দিন যেন আমার বাড়ি হইব গাড়ি হইব জিও সে রেডি আমি লন্ডন আছি এখন উন্নত লাইফের আসা আর আমার স্বপ্ন বাস্তবায়নের সহযোগিতা করা তাজ সলিসিটার we are committed to help people like lal to achieve their dreams taj solicitors believe in service getting into debt is easy getting out of debt is the hard part if you're struggling to meet your repayments call ndc to find out how you could become debt free with an iva providing you qualify your monthly repayments will be reduced by hundreds of pounds and up to 75% off your debt will be written off setting you completely debt free call ndc on 0800 121 4733 ব্রিটেনের কমিউনিটির বিশ্বস্ত প্রতিষ্ঠান আলসাফা হজ গ্রুপ হজ যাত্রীদের জন্য সুখবর দশ বছর পূর্তি উপলক্ষে বিশেষ ছাড় একশো পাউন্ড কমে মাত্র চার হাজার সাতশো পাউন্ডে হজ পালনের সুযোগ মক্কা শরীফে মাত্র চার মিনিটের দূরত্বে হোটেল লুলু আল সাইফ এবং মদিনা শরীফে মাত্র পাঁচ মিনিটের দূরত্বে হোটেল মানাদাত আল আকসা প্যাকেজে থাকছে ভিসা রিয়ার টিকেট ট্রান্সপোর্ট জিয়ারা ফুড এবং অভিজ্ঞ গাইড আরো পাচ্ছেন বিশ্বের যে কোনো দেশের রিয়ার টিকেট সহ মানি ট্রান্সফার ও কার্গো সার্ভিস আজই যোগাযোগ করুন আলসাফা ট্রাভেলস এ ফোন ও টু ও এইট ডবল ফাইভ ডবল ফাইভ ফাইভ টু সিক্স আলসাফা ট্রাভেলস হজ ও সবাইকে স্বাগত জানাচ্ছি আমাদের আজকের বিশেষ একটি অনুষ্ঠানে এন ইভিনিং উইথ আনোয়ার চৌধুরী গত কয়েকদিন ধরে আপনারা এই অনুষ্ঠানের বিভিন্ন কার্যক্রম টেলিভিশনে দেখছেন এবং তারই ধারাবাহিকতায় আজকে আমরা আনোয়ার চৌধুরী যাকে নতুন করে পরিচয় করিয়ে দেওয়ার কিছু নেই যাকে আমরা চিনি যিনি ব্রিটিশ একজন রাষ্ট্রদূত ছিলেন বাংলাদেশের একজন হাই কমিশনার ছিলেন পরবর্তীতে পেরুতে অ্যাম্বাসেডার হিসেবে ব্রিটিশ গভর্নমেন্টের জন্য তিনি দায়িত্ব পালন করেছেন বর্তমানে তিনি আপনারা নিশ্চয়ই জানেন যে অত্যন্ত সম্মানজনক এবং ক্ষমতা ধারি একটি অবস্থান ক্যামেন আইল্যান্ডস এর গভর্নর হিসেবে বর্তমান সরকার তাকে নিয়োগ দিয়েছেন দর্শক মন্ডলী আজকে আমরা আনোয়ার চৌধুরীর সাথে কথা বলবো এবং তার সাথে কথা বলার জন্য আমরা স্টুডিওতে আমন্ত্রণ জানিয়েছি লন্ডন লন্ডনের বাইরে থেকে পঞ্চান্ন জন বিশেষ অতিথিকে যারা নতুন প্রজন্মের প্রতিনিধিত্ব করে যারা আনোয়ার চৌধুরীর কাছ থেকে জানার চেষ্টা করবেন আনোয়ার চৌধুরীর আজকে এই অবস্থানে আসার পেছনে কি কাজ করেছে কোন স্পৃহা কাজ করেছে এবং ভবিষ্যতে আনোয়ার চৌধুরী তার বর্তমান সফলতাকে কিভাবে কমিউনিটির মধ্যে ছড়িয়ে দিতে চান আনোয়ার চৌধুরী ওয়েলকাম টু দি শো थैंक यू फॉर हम इट्स वेरी वेरी नाइस टू बी हियर एंड आई रियली डू वांट टू थैंक यू फॉर अरेंजिंग दिस राधा यूनिक इवनिंग एम as you say as a conversation with um many friends and some people who i have not met before but all um brilliant aspiring um young um british bangladeshis uh it is a conversation that i'm looking forward to uh, having for uh, so i wanted to thank you and channel s for producing this show and getting it together apnar kache je kono prashno korar age the the first question anybody would ask yes um how was your journey in peru how was the journey in peru well that journey is still hasn't finished but it was like uh other experiences i've had uh, it was quite extraordinary it has been extraordinary uh i've served there now for three and a half years and um i think what i will take away is the the thing that combines us the thing that unites us as people as human beings together doesn't differ whether you are at one end of the planet or whether you are at the other end of the planet as you know as you said i was high commissioner british high commissioner to bangladesh peru is probably the most furthest away yes uh from from the point of bangladesh and the similarities i found the engagement we had the things we did together um will stay with me so it's been a fantastic three and a half years my family have really enjoyed it and i think i'm about to leave um uh, that country that great country where the peruvians say to us that we are now closer doshok mondoli apnara dekhchen 
an evening with Anwar Chaudhary. Amra Anwar Chaudhary ka thi ke tar shamprutik dini je ambassador chilen je deshti the British shorkar er pakhote ke Peru. Amra je deshti ki chini Peru naam hai. Shei deshe er bot tar obikota amader shathe share kollen. Dini er aage apna ra jaane je Bangladesh er High Commissioner chilen. Ech harao dini British government er bivinno guru tu puno daitto palon kore chen. Tar jibon er bot toman karjokram karjokram shampur ke jana jonno. এবং এর পেছনের আরো কিছু তথ্য জানার জন্য আমরা ছোট্ট একটি প্রতিবেদন তৈরি করেছি করেছি ছোট্ট একটি ডকুমেন্টারি তৈরি করেছি চলুন দেখে আসি সেই ছোট্ট ডকুমেন্টারি আনোয়ার চৌধুরী সুনামগঞ্জের জগন্নাথপুরের প্রভাকরপুর গ্রামে তার জন্ম ছোটবেলা থেকে মেধাবী তকমা পাওয়া আনোয়ারের বেড়ে ওঠা গ্রামীণ পরিবেশে আর দশটা সাধারণ শিশুর মতো আনোয়ারের জীবনও ছিল দুরন্তপনায় ভরপুর কৈশোরের শুরুতেই পরিবারের সাথে যুক্তরাজ্যে আগমন সদ্য বিলেতে আসা আনোয়ারের কৈশোর ছিল পড়াশোনা আর দৈনন্দিন কাজে পরিবারকে সহযোগিতা করা তবে যে সময়টাতে ব্যবসায়ী অথবা জীবিকার কাজে মনোযোগী হওয়া স্বাভাবিক আনোয়ার চৌধুরী সেই সময়টাতে বেছে নেন ইলেকট্রিক্যাল ইঞ্জিনিয়ারিং নিয়ে পড়াশোনা চাকরি জীবনে সবাই যখন খোঁজে নিশ্চয়তা আত্মবিশ্বাসী আনোয়ার তখন যোগ দেন রয়্যাল এয়ারফোর্সের ইঞ্জিনিয়ারিং স্ট্র্যাটেজিস্ট হিসেবে সাফল্যের ধারাবাহিকতায় আনোয়ার দায়িত্ব পালন করেন ক্যাবিনেট অফিসের ডিরেক্টর সহ ব্রিটিশ সরকারের বিভিন্ন গুরুত্বপূর্ণ বিভাগে তবে আমাদের কমিউনিটি এবং সারা বিশ্বের বাঙালির কাছে তিনি আলোচনায় আসেন ব্রিটিশ সরকার যখন তাকে ব্রিটিশ হাই কমিশনার হিসেবে বাংলাদেশে নিয়োগ দেয় প্রত্যাশার চূড়ায় অবস্থা নিয়ে যখন আনোয়ার চৌধুরী ব্রিটিশ বাংলাদেশিদের সাফল্যের মাইল ফলক তখনই তাকে বাংলাদেশেই জঙ্গি সন্ত্রাসীরা আক্রান্ত করে কিন্তু জন্মভূমির প্রতি অগাধ আস্থা নিয়ে তিনি তার পুরো দায়িত্ব পালন করে বিলেতে এসে আরও প্রভাবশালী দায়িত্ব পালন করেন যার সর্বশেষ সংযোজন ছিল পেরুতে ব্রিটিশ অ্যাম্বাসেডার হিসাবে নিয়োগ তবে সবকিছু ছাপিয়ে তার সাফল্যের দিকটিকে আরও উজ্জ্বল করেছে কেইমেন আইল্যান্ডসের গভর্নর হিসেবে তার নিয়োগ পশ্চিম ক্যারিবীয় অঞ্চলের একটি ব্রিটিশ দ্বীপ কেইমেন আইল্যান্ডস অর্থনৈতিক কারণে গুরুত্বপূর্ণ হলেও পর্যটন স্থান হিসেবে পৃথিবীর আরেক ভূস্বর্গ বলা হয় এই আইল্যান্ডকে প্রায় দুইশো বর্গ কিলোমিটারের দ্বীপটিতে ষাট হাজার মানুষের বসবাস বিশ্বের সব বৃহৎ ফিনান্সিয়াল ইনস্টিটিউশন আর বাঘা বাঘা ব্যবসায়ীদের বসবাস এবং অবকাশস্থল হচ্ছে এই ছোট্ট দ্বীপ অর্থনৈতিক গুরুত্ব বিবেচনায় নিউইয়র্ক লন্ডন টোকিও এবং হংকংয়ের পরপরই ক্যাইমেন আইল্যান্ডসের অবস্থান বিশ্বের প্রভাবশালী অর্থনৈতিক এই দ্বীপের সবচেয়ে ক্ষমতাধর ব্যক্তি হিসেবে তার নিয়োগ আরেকবার আমাদেরকে করেছে উজ্জ্বল আনোয়ার চৌধুরী একটি নাম একটি ব্র্যান্ড এবং আমাদের গর্ব উই আর টকিং अबाउट ইউ ভেরিয়াস রেসপন্সিবিলিটিস ইন দ্য পাস্ট স্পেশালি অ্যাজ এ ডিপ্লোম্যাট ইয়েস আই উড বি ইন্টারেস্টেড টু নো মোর अबाउट ইউ রেসপন্সিবিলিটিস আই মিন ইউ হ্যাভ মেনশনড দ্যাট ইউ হ্যাভ বিন অ্যাপয়েন্টেড অ্যাজ হাই কমিশনার এন্ড দেন এমবাসেডর নাও দ্য কাফনা ইয়েস Uh, how, uh, what's the difference between High Commissioner, Ambassador and now the Governor? What are the differences? First of all, High Commissioner and Ambassador is more or less the same thing. Uh, it is essentially the same thing. As you know, if it's a Commonwealth country, an Ambassador from a Commonwealth country, or the Envoy, to another Commonwealth country, we call it High Commissioner. Okay? So the Ambassador from Canada to the UK here will be called the Canadian High Commissioner. The British person to Canada will be called the Canadian High Commissioner because they're part of the Commonwealth. So the 54 or so country in the Commonwealth, we call ourselves um, uh, High Commissioner. Everybody else is called Ambassador. The Governor role is, is totally different to that in a sense, in that you've been appointed by Her Majesty's Government and the, the Queen uh, to be the Queen's representative uh, in this jurisdiction, in the territory. And your primary responsibility is good governance. Okay? Good governance for the territory in everything that this entails. Um, in the Cayman, for example, we have uh, parliamentary democracy. Um, there are 20 or so MPs. There is a prime minister. 
Um, but my function uh, would be uh, like a proxy head of state um, representing the Queen. Um, and, the, and the government works very closely with the, with the governor, the prime minister, uh, works very closely, and so does the whole government. There is a speaker. It's just like a mini, uh, mini House of Parliament with 20 MPs rather than 600 MPs. Uh, but the governor also has some direct responsibilities, which is not delegated to the um, the government, and and that is uh, for for defence, uh, good governance overall, for defence, for international relations, and for security. Those are held back, um, but you can delegate those too. Uh, as specific responsibility of the of the governor. Tell us about your childhood. This is, I think, <laughs> the interesting part. I mean, uh, well, it's increasingly a very Bangladesh. long time ago. You born in Bangladesh? <laughs> did you remember? You born in Bangladesh? <laughs> yes, I do remember that bit. Um, uh, I'm you, not you that old you yet. You were born in Bangladesh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, childhood. Uh, how to um, how to wrap it all up? Uh, summarize it quickly. As you know. Um, Born in, in Sunam Gonj, uh, a, a great place of water, of song, and great food, and wonderful people. I'm sure you will agree. Yes. Uh, so uh, I was born in uh, Sunam Gonj, and, and then at the age of eight or so, we, uh, we immigrated to uh, the UK. I had a wonderful time in, in Bangladesh as a child, walking on the river, um, you know, trying to catch birds and, and, and all that sort of things, playing how do you do, playing all those things that a Bangladeshi kid grows up with. I had a very traditional village, village kid upbringing, you know, went to school, you know, and then after that we did some Arabic and then, you know, the, the teacher came for the evening lessons and all of that and it was, it was a sweet time. Uh, I have a brother who is close to my age so and, and friends and, and and that's what we did you know and then we came to UK I was um, around 10 um, and, and I grew up here as a, as a British kid basically um, up in Rochdale in near Manchester uh, and then in the East End of London uh, where we still have a huge community in Bethnal Green um, uh, and then um, then we moved around and you know the rest of so you became a very well-known household name in the British Bangladeshi um, community after becoming the British High Commissioner yes. to Bangladesh. Yes. So how did it happen? I mean, did you approach or it, it just came as, I mean, ongoing responsibility? I don't know. Maybe yes. you will know that better than me. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, for me, I, until that time, I was in the British Civil Service. I was director in the Cabinet Office. Um, but with some of these jobs, you know, although they are very... Uh, I mean, did they come to you as a proposal? Do you want to go to Bangladesh as a British High Commissioner? No, I chose to. You chose to. Uh, okay. I, I absolutely... Uh, it was so was there any other countries to... Yes, kind of there, were, uh, there were others, uh, okay. and others were offered. Okay. Uh, and remember, I was already director in the Cabinet Office. I was doing a great job. Uh, I was enjoying it. It was a great time. Um, so being an ambassador in itself wasn't, wasn't the wasn't what motivated me. I wanted to do this specific job. Responsibility. This, no, this specific Position. ambassador okay. where I wanted to serve two countries I loved. And, and so I, I said to them, it, it is going to be, have to be <laughs> Dhaka. <laughs> and then I, I remember walking back from the, um, uh, the interview uh, stage and then kicking myself all the way back to the cabinet office, thinking, why on earth did I say no to everything else? Uh, but it was just a natural reaction because that's what I wanted to do because it was... You know, one of these dream things that you have as a child. I always wanted to serve in some way. And, and that was the ultimate expression for me at that particular, at that particular time. So you were a target to be assassinated. In yes, Select. an assassination attempt, yes. Yes, yes. assassination yes. yes. I mean, yes. Uh, and we know that the criminal um, have now faced the justice system of Bangladesh. I mean, yes. did that incident um, change your percep perception? about Bangladesh? No, no, it didn't at all. Um, and as you know, I, I got hospitalized. I was here for six weeks in um, St. Thomas's. Um, so it, obviously these things are quite traumatic. Uh, and I, I remember, you know, and even at that time, the, the Foreign Office were kind enough to say, um, would you consider going somewhere else as ambassador? And I remember that question. Uh, and uh, and the and the reaction internally for me was was strong. You know, it says that would be a disaster. 
that that would absolutely be a disaster for me as an individual of who I am. Um, and so I said, I insisted that I, I go back and finish the job uh, that we started. Anything else wouldn't have been meaningful for me, um, uh, although the options uh, uh, options were there. So that doesn't, I, it didn't change my life. In, in fact, um, it made me appreciate the, the challenges that ordinary Bangladeshi people and indeed people around the world face. You know, I survived. Three people died at that incident. Yes. And it, you know, um, so it made you think, and it made you think about what is it that you can do, that you can add, however small it is, however small, we can't change the world, but we can change some small thing, some small amount. And for me, that was this small amount, that I, I could make a small contribution and face this and show that we must act against it and defeat it, and we mustn't let, essentially, terrorists and cowards you know, drive us away from the values uh, that we believe. So I remember, I remember that. But I think, um, you know, t to your question, does these things put you off? No, it actually makes you. It will make. I, I suspect it will make 99% of people stronger. Uh, since 9/11, yes, uh, the global diplomacy uh, is visibly kind of shifting, um, and there is a change of global diplomacy. Do you do you feel the change? since 9-11, especially the Western dip diplomacy? As somebody once said, the only uh, constant in the world is change. <laughs> um, and so it's not, it's, I don't think it's exactly right to say that it's now changing and it hadn't changed before. And perhaps it's changing a little bit faster. The challenges we face have always been um, violence, wars, um, now terrorism, extremism coming from a certain angle. Um, uh, the other challenges for diplomacy is trade, building up good relationships, uh, globalization. So all of that is still there as it always was. It is changing at a faster rate. Perhaps um, things don't look as set as they used to be. In the Cold War, there was a setting uh, for a long period of time where you had blocks and you could think about it in those ways. Things are, of course, now much more dynamic and I think you have to be more agile about how you respond, more f understanding, more flexible, more listening um, and essentially more engaging to, to, to manage that. Um, and it's not easy to see how um, uh, some of this will uh, quieten down very quickly. That's what makes the job so, uh, so fascinating. And, and that's why the time goes by so, so quickly. You are right to say the world is, in some places, more dangerous uh, than it has been. Um, we are facing everything from climate change to the extremist violence um, to the shake-up of global institutions, as we are seeing, um, um, uh, shake-up of the whole trade system, uh, all of that. Uh, but that is, this is the challenge for or next generation uh, to, to take up. Coming back to our community, yes. um, are we failing to create 10 or maybe 20 Anwar Choudhury's in our community? No, what not do you at think? all. No, absolutely not, because our, our community, look at our community now. You know, uh, uh, let's just go back, what, 15 years or 13 years when I was posted to Dhaka. At that time, it was, this is absolute, because I remember talking about it. I said, um, at a speech. If you go to any Bangladeshi family, you'll find one student at university. This was back in 2003 I'm talking about. Now I challenge you to go to a Bangladeshi and to find me families where all the kids are not at university or are, are, are doing something. I, I, I don't, there may be, but it's now the exception. We have now got high court judges, mm -hmm. okay? Um, recently, Sarah Clap Chowdhury, I don't know if you've um, uh, heard about um, uh, uh, senior high court uh, judge. Um, we have other ambassadors. Um, the first two um, uh, British ambassadors who were not white were both of Bangladeshi origin, me and Asif Ahmed. Yes. Asif was ambassador to um, to Philippines and now he's high commissioner too. Um, if you look at all the doctors that we have, uh, senior consultant, deans of medicine, you know, uh, my 
child, my baby, uh, Emilia, just a week ago, was delivered by, I didn't know it at the time, he, he, he said it, by a very young uh, British Bangladeshi consultant who went to Cambridge to do his degree. He's 32, I think, consultant already at the age of 32. This is the sort of thing you see. We have politicians, um, God knows how many councillors we have across the country. We have engineers, business people, financial people, everywhere I look. I urge you as a media entity to bring these uh, people out and show what is happening. We, we have to go to a short break, but before yes. we <coughs> go to the break, yes. uh, we have got some short questions. Some questions. quick fire? Yeah. Right. So, the first question, uh, we have some images as well on screen for the audience to see. Oh, God. Um, Baul Abdul Karim or Michael Jackson? Uh, you know the answer to this. Uh, I think everybody in this audience who is there will know the answer. It has to be Karim, of course. Uh, because, you know, uh, Karim I see as a poet. I think people see him as a singer, but he's actually a poet. If you read the stuff he's written, you'll understand what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying. And he's a phenomenal poet of, of, of intensity, of, of knowledge and brilliance and a, a depth of soul that I have not see have not come across if you were appointed as high commissioner or, or ambassador which yeah. country would you choose peru or bangladesh oh this is this is what the americans called uh, a question between a rock and a hard place right <laughs> <laughs> well uh, the, the i think the answer to that is i have obviously chosen both but uh, uh, factually, you have to choose one uh, the... actually i have chosen both. i think i would do them in the order that i did or you do a lot for the reasons i have or you said. do a lot for them uh, uh, yes, perhaps, but also, uh, you know, as people of Peru who may watch this, uh, they will know the sort of relationship we, we have. I haven't felt that difference. Okay, you just said, I mean, a while ago, that you were a normal kid uh, in your childhood. Right? Yes. So did you wear a lungi? I have worn a lungi, yes. Okay. Not as a kid. Okay. I actually wore it um, uh, not in Bangladesh, here in the UK. Mm -hmm. We did a fashion show. Okay. With, with lungis. This is going back sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, and actually it was the best scene in that fashion show. With, uh, did, did, you, did you ever play um, Hadudu wearing lungi? It's quite fun, you know? No, I was wearing, because I was only about eight, okay. I was wearing not lungi but, a, but pants. Short pants. Yes, I played Hadudu, yes, and I was, was alright because I was a very skinny kid so I could... Okay. <laughs> what would you play with your friends and family between Ludu, you know Ludu? Ludu, yes, yeah. I, I know Ludu. And Hadudu, which one do you play? With friends, how did you do, and Ludo with the family. So well, with friends, you'll play how did you do? Yes, for sure. I, I love that game. I don't know why it's not a more popular game internationally. It is a great game. Yes. I think somebody ought to, please, somebody promote this game and make it into an international thing. I think uh, India plays it, Bangladesh plays it, and do Pakistan play it. I think in the subcontinent. I, I don't know the if the Chinese play it. I, but it's, it's confined to that area. Area, yes. It, it deserves to, to, to come out. Expansion, yeah. Yeah. So in a household dominated by ladies, yes. who is your um, favorite between these three? Amani, <laughs> Ambi, yeah. and Amelia? Uh, this is the most unfairest question you, <laughs> can ask, you can ask a father. I am extremely lucky to, uh, to have three daughters and a, and a son. Um, so I am surrounded by now four women, yes. my wife Momina plus my three daughters, and they all bring I think as a father, you notice it most. They bring different things to you. Amani has a, a tremendous, dry, wicked sense of humor, and I love talking to her. This is my eldest daughter. We have, we have great conversation, and she's at an age now where you can discuss things. Uh, Ambi is an extremely sweet, uh, very caring, very cuddly, uh, shows her emotions much more, very bright, uh, young girl who wants to be a rocket scientist and Emilia as I said uh, you know after 30 seconds she smiled <laughs> so uh, how can you choose between between those three but I think you're right I as I said my my whole uh, my whole conclusion is that I have been an extremely lucky man not just professionally but also uh, personally I think you're doing unfair with Mumina Bhabi what about her She's one of the most genuine people you'll meet. She's quite passionate. Um, she will say what she, uh, what she thinks. Um, she's deeply caring for people. 
Uh, but she's also uh, a person who, if she doesn't like something, will also say that too. Um, and she has many, many close friends. In, in Peru, for example, I think on her network, she has more sort of friends and people uh, than I do. Because they I mean just indigenous people? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. Peruvian people. Peruvian Peru people, okay. And she doesn't speak Spanish very well. Um, you know, and so that says something about the individual who can connect, uh, uh, who can connect like that. I think uh, when we were leaving, because she has now left, and uh, she's now here, um, and um, the number of parties they did in her honor, you know, it's just, just amazing. You know, I hope they will do the same for me, but <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, so you know, that's, that's, that's my meaning. And she's quiet. <coughs> Anur Chaudhary, we have to go to a short break. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, as you all know, that Mumina Bhabi just gave a bar to a beautiful baby last week. So let's congratulate and give a big clap uh, to the newborn. <laughs> and with that note, Doshak Madhuli, I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. আজকে আমরা ব্রিটিশ বাংলাদেশি কমিউনিটির উদ্যমান কিছু প্রফেশনালকে কিছু তরুণ তরুণীকে আমন্ত্রণ জানিয়েছি এবং যারা সাকসেসফুল এন্টারপ্রেনর তাদেরকে আমরা আমন্ত্রণ জানিয়েছি এবং তাদের সাথে আনোয়ার চৌধুরীর কনভারসেশন কনভারসেশনে যোগ দিবেন তারা প্রশ্ন করবেন আনোয়ার চৌধুরী তার এক্সপেরিয়েন্স থেকে মূল্যায়ন করবেন সেই সব প্রশ্নগুলো যাতে ছোট্ট একটু বিরতিতে আমাদের সঙ্গেই থাকেন সবাইকে ধন্যবাদ Coming soon, Allsol Maj Bajar, UK biggest Maj Bajar now in Allsol, the Midlands. Get ready for your home shopping. Allsol Maj Bajar, 50 Mount Street, Allsol. Opening soon. দর্শক বিরতির পর সবাইকে স্বাগত জানাচ্ছি আমাদের আজকের বিশেষ অনুষ্ঠান এন ইভিনিং উইথ আনোয়ার চৌধুরী আমরা আনোয়ার চৌধুরীর কাছ থেকে জানলাম তার অভিজ্ঞতা সম্পর্কে কর্মের মাধ্যমে দায়িত্বের মাধ্যমে সেটি আমরা তার কাছ থেকে জানার চেষ্টা করলাম এবারে আমরা চলে যাচ্ছি অনুষ্ঠানের মূল পর্বে কনভারসেশন আওয়ারে যেখানে আমরা আমাদের সামনে আছেন ব্রিটিশ বাংলাদেশের কমিউনিটির অনেক তরুণ তরুণী সাকসেসফুল অন্টারপ্রনার এবং যারাই ভবিষ্যতে আমাদেরকে নেতৃত্ব দিবেন আমাদের কমিউনিটিকে নেতৃত্ব দিবেন আমি সময় নষ্ট করব না আমি প্রথমেই চলে যাব কাশিফ কামালি হি ইজ দি ওনলি ব্রিটিশ বাংলাদেশি স্টুডেন্ট স্টার্টিং এট ইটন কলেজ উইথ এ স্কলারশিপ অফকোর্স অ্যান্ড ইটন কলেজ হ্যাজ প্রডিউসড নাইনটিন ব্রিটিশ প্রাইম মিনিস্টার্স ইন দি ইউকে কাশিফ ইউর কোয়েশ্চেন প্লিজ সো মাই কোয়েশ্চেন ইজ হোয়াট ডজ ওয়ান নিড ইন টার্মস অফ লাইফ এক্সপিরিয়েন্স একাডেমিক মেরিটস অ্যান্ড ক্যারেক্টার টু সাকসেসফুলি এডভান্স ইন টু দি আপার একলন্স অফ দ্য পলিটিক্যাল রিনা ইট ইজ এ a very good very good question i think that will be of of interest to many but first of all can i congratulate you on what you've already achieved um if you are seriously interested in 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 leadership roles and in success and for me it it came down to five five things that i talk about and i won't go into it in any detail uh, the first thing and 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 people say it all the time is confidence but confidence where does confidence come from is is probably a better question and confidence really comes from comes from exposure it comes from experiencing different people different situations meeting different people putting yourself at some risk getting yourself out of the comfort zone leaving your community hard as it is going to an university somewhere else all of that so getting yourself get being confident is not something that you're born you you build it 
because once you see other people, once you see other things, you realize that you are as good as the rest. That comes to many of us. So confidence is, is, is one. Uh, the second thing is, I would say, communication. Communication uh, in the sense, not, not just orally, but also in writing. Okay. We are blessed uh, with having the English language as our, as our first language here. Uh, the English language is simply power now. Speaking English, starting is quite, quite easy, but to become master at it, to be able to communicate, to be able to share your dreams like Luther King did your, with the rest of the world and make it part of them, it requires a level of skill in communication. Even in writing an email, can you write an email so that it's actually delightful? So the person who reads it looks forward to it. So communication, I think, is, is, is uh, hugely important. Curiosity, the need to want to learn, just getting your degree is never enough. Do you, are you curious enough so that people want to follow you? I think having courage at the right moments are also, it's not the courage to go and attack a hill, but when you look at successful people, it's what they do when they're down that makes a difference. It's not what you do when you're up, it's what you do when you're down. Many life's experiences, you know, Something happens to a member of family, a divorce, um, financial problems, uh, some unlucky thing that's hit you. So having the courage at that time to do the right thing, to stay strong, I think is important. And finally, of the five things I've, I've, I've said, finally humility, but genuine humility, to know your limitations, to know, as I do, that, uh, and I think every successful person will tell you, of course, you need to work hard, you need to get qualifications, but in the end, a lot of it, 50% of it, is luck. Not to forget that. The person you are sitting next to... Uh, the person you are sitting next to could easily have done what you've done and more, but maybe just the way life worked out, the probability. Uh, but, you know, just to sort of uh, finish up, with, of course, you have to create your own luck, and as the joke goes, you know, you can win the lottery uh, and pray, but in the end, God will say, look, you need to come halfway and buy a ticket. So you need to buy a ticket in terms of prepare yourself. Major bin Ahmed, another talented young lady uh, from our community. Um, she was a former student welfare officer at UCL, GDL student. Major bin Ahmed. So you touched on your role about being High Commissioner to Bangladesh and how it was a revolutionary role for you. Um, I wanted to ask, being British Bangladeshi, did you find that that was an advantage to the role when serving as High Commissioner to Bangladesh, or did it bring challenges? The, the job of a diplomat is to serve the interest of his country, Great Britain. Okay. I was lucky to be in a country where the interests, both of Bangladesh and of Great Britain, uh, were totally aligned. Um, and so I didn't face uh, some of the challenges, but there's always challenges when you, um, on how you do the job, um, on, you know, on corruption, on uh, your reputation as an individual. It's very difficult, you know, we are a family orientated community um, as a people, as Bangladesh, British Bangladesh and Bangladeshis and the Indian subcontinent. So I had to make sure that I separated uh, my duties away from friends and family very, very clearly. I think that was uh, one of the things I said, the first thing I said to my staff in the British High Commission is if anybody comes and says they are part of my family, give them minus 10 points to start off with, you know, so whatever, because that is just, and I think, um, I think it's important to set your principles I have not had, I served four years in Bangladesh, not one individual came up to me and asked for a favour, not one. We'll go to one of our own, Kohinur Kabir, oh. uh, Channel Selection Uposthapika, presenter, and at the same time she is a recruitment business partner for a top tier investment bank, Kohinur Kabir. Some would say that one of the hardest things is to get your first uh, yes. the, you know, first role after university. Yes. Um, what advice would you give to the upcoming generation on how they can best prepare in getting their first role after university? Getting the first job is very, very difficult uh, because you don't have 
a proven history? And the straight answer, the simple answer to your question is not only having the background qualification, and, and now we have got a community and a country where getting a degree is, is, is not as uncommon you know, it's not as uncommon as it used to be. So obviously qualification and all of that, but that doesn't actually make the difference. The difference comes from confidence. Okay, the first job that you apply to, at the interview particularly, it, com it comes from the, how, you, um, how you react, how you promote, how you present yourself. And within having done so many recruitment sort of things, within two minutes, a recruitment manager will know whether he or she wants to hire this uh, individual. And where does that confidence come from? Where does it come from? It comes from what we talked about earlier. It comes from getting yourself exposed and experienced in different life situations with different people, not just getting a first class degree. Many recruitment people, they've got 200 applications okay, to sift through. They can't you can't ask them to look through your case and make the case for you. So you have to write in one page why you are the best suited person to that. And remember, it's not about you. It's about what you're going to bring to this organization, this company, this government institution, whatever, this charity, whatever it is. And if you can get that down to a page, why I am the most suitable, why I can make a difference to your company, they will interview you. For the question, Jabra, and the question will be asked by Sabia Kamali, CEO, CEO, Sisters Forum. Sabia Kamali. My question is: As I work on the grassroots level, yes. with the constant rise of Islamophobia, right. um, discrimination, or racism, how would we, as British Bangladeshi or British Muslim, identify ourselves? How would we redefine our identity? I am British. Full stop. Okay, I am not a Bangladeshi living in Britain. I love my heritage of Bangladesh, okay? I am also a Muslim. This country is my country. I am not going to be a victim in my own country. I am not going to have my horizons curtailed by assumptions and barriers that sometimes are put up and sometimes are created in our own heads. Okay, so I have no conflict, as, as I hope I have demonstrated by being British High Commissioner in Bangladesh, of all places, that this is a false problem, actually. We do face barriers and discrimination. Islamophobia is on the rise. But as, as reasonable people, we need to see what is it that we can do to stop that? I actually believe that we should make more efforts to integrate ourselves. If you define yourself as a single identity, other people will react to you as a single identity. So those are things we need to think about. We need to make sure that we don't create barriers for ourselves imagine things that doesn't exist and fight the things that does exist that is unfair stands to make this country even greater and make us even more successful and and and, and prosperous but don't become a professional something else don't become a professional bangladeshi you know you're not you're a brit okay and this country needs you to make a success of yourself and of your of your of your country so and you can love Bangladesh, you can go there, you can invest there, you can do what you like. There is no country, there is nothing there at all. So let's not do that. And we must stay away from these temptations, these easy things to find ourselves labeled as, as, as something, you know, and, and then just behave accordingly to this label. This is, this is dangerous, this is unhelpful, this holds us back. Please don't do this. Tamanna Mia. A recent graduate and, and a campaigner from Kent, Tamanna Mia. Now, before Tamanna asks a question, uh, I would like to show our audience a picture. Uh, Tamanna, please stand up and then we'll show a picture. So, the oh. President of France, the Prime Minister of United Kingdom, and in the middle, we've got Tamanna. Tamanna, yes, well, clearly. 
What happened in that picture? Uh, I was at a reception at the V&A, and I'm one of the Franco-British young leaders, so we kind of link together the France and the UK, and we kind of get young people involved in connecting the communities together to create community cohesion. So I went to a reception, and um, I met with the leaders, of course, um, Theresa May and President Emmanuel, and um, they have a fetish for photos. Uh, they like taking photos. So I simply kind of met with them, shook their hand, talked to them about my community work, and uh, we had some nice conversations, and we asked uh, for a group selfie. So uh, that's how the famous selfie came about into every single newspaper uh, in the UK and also in uh, online as well. So that was how it worked. Um, but it was a nice experience. Um, it was more about uh, communities. <laughs> Yes, I have a question. So, obviously, you've done a lot in public service. Um, how did you first come into the Foreign Office? Uh, what was your experiences? Um, if you could tell us a bit about that, that would be right. great. As you know from my career history, my, my first degree is in engineering because I really believed in uh, putting electricity everywhere because I thought that was the, that's the answer to development and all of that. Uh, and then through a career in engineering, MOD, Royal Air Force, Cabinet Office, so when I was in the Cabinet Office as Director for Modernising Government, um, I had come across the Foreign Office quite a lot. And this original idea of trying to be of some service to uh, developing countries, uh, Bangladesh, uh, as well as others, by doing electricity, that concept stayed with me, although I didn't get to do what I wanted to do when I was a young guy. And then, um, uh, as it happens, I was doing a speech uh, for the Cabinet Office talking about modernising government in Greece, of all places. Um, and um, the Foreign Office knew of me, and they eventually invited me over. And I said, look, I'm not actually interested. Uh, because I have a great job, and I did have a great job in the Cabinet Office. In the, uh, but I am interested in this, which was to become High Commissioner. Uh, and then, as I uh, to Bangladesh, <laughs> um, and um, and then we went for a competitive. Our process is through competition, okay. Um, and I competed with I think eight other people, um, and um, uh, luckily I um, uh, I got through. Look, I went to a school in the East End. You know, uh, our young friend there is going to Eton. Okay, so you guys, you know, you are much better <laughs> prepared than I was. So all of you can do this. The, the variety of jobs that are open to you in public service, whether it's civil service or foreign service, is just infinite. Whether you're in the Ministry of Defense or in the Treasury or in DFID or wherever it is, Education Department, it is a whole world that you can spend 20 lives and still not, uh, uh, still not um, get to the end of it. So um, that's, that's how, how, how it happened in foreign service. Once you're there, we in the UK, we have subtle cultures uh, on the surface, but underneath, those cultures are quite strong and thick. And to succeed in them, it requires uh, a bit of understanding of how the civil service, how UK, how British people think, how we operate, our famous understatement. Um, you know the balanced approach, all of that. These sort of competencies you get to build up from, from the experience, and it's very important in the diplomatic service. As I, as I said, you know, the essential job of a diplomat is, the hardest job is to carry bad news without actually destroying the relationship. That's not so easy. Okay, that's what we really paid for. Dr. Ashfaq Choudhury, a head teacher and the chair for uh, Association of Muslim Schools. Dr. Ashfaq Choudhury? What opportunities would you think there might be for uh, British, of course, Bangladeshi heritage people, to look at education investment opportunities where you're going to be handed next? I know it's a bit premature question, yes, but I thought uh, I'd pitch it to you. Yes, well, uh, well thank you for that. But um, I, I, the way I look at education is uh, much more globally. For me, in my experience, there's two things you need to develop fast, education and infrastructure. It's those two things. So education, I think, is a market that is growing. There is huge opportunities in education, and we have one unique advantage, and that's the English language. People want an education and an education in the English language, with the English language. A BSc chemistry is good from anywhere. BSc chemistry with English language is just 
that much more powerful. And we have that as a natural advantage. Peru has now signed up to become bilingual in English by 2021. It will be the first South American country to do that. Uh, as a business, as, as well as teaching and all the rest of it, because it is a growth market. And it's quite an easy growth market for us because of the language, if you're talking about internationally. Naushad Ahmed, Associate Director, Equity Sales Trading. The question I had was, it goes back a little bit, is um, I know you moved to the UK uh, at a young age from Bangladesh. Yes. Can you tell us about some of the challenges you faced and um, how you overcame them? At that time, 1970s, um, in, in the north where I lived for the first four years and then in growing up in the east end of London, racial discrimination was an everyday thing. Survival sometimes was the objective of the day. But just physically not getting attacked as a child, not being called, you know, um, names, uh, not coming home crying because somebody did something, threw something at you and all that. So those things, I, and I went to a school, I mean, it, it's still there, Daneford School, isn't it? Um, uh, and that area was a very rough area, and, and, and in Rochdale too, where you had to find enough reserve to not to allow that sort of thing to destroy you. Uh, that was a, a major challenge. And then, of course, in, in that time, um, as, as, as we know, our fathers, uh, our grandfathers, they, we only had one trade, and that's we finished school as quickly as we could and, and then opened a restaurant or worked in one, right? So I started that at the age of 14. I was working as a part-time waiter at the weekend. Um, and and, and, and to, at that time to think, Look, I could do something else, you know, I could become a doctor, an engineer, or something. and at that time we were looking at the professions because they were the easiest thing to get a job in, right? So those overcoming those things and saying I can do something, uh, something more than this, maybe I'll do. Uh, so that, I think that uh, was a challenge. Poverty is always a challenge. If you're growing up uh, in a low-income household, you don't get to enjoy all the things that you see around you. Um, it's worthwhile reminding that life can be very different um, and have been very, very different. So we faced those, uh, those sort of uh, uh, challenges. And I think um, I've, um, luckily, uh, it, hasn't, it hasn't destroyed uh, what, what may have been destroyed. Thank you, Anwar Choudhury. Sure. Next question by uh, Tanvir Mahathab, FCC, a chartered accountant. Tanvir Mahathab. People often ask us about our success and our motivation. So I wanted to pose the same question to you. At this stage of your life, also as a new father, what motivates you? I think what motivates me is when I see, when I see that an interaction, something that I can do or have done, has made some small difference to somebody or something. If I think I can, by, through a job that I do, or something that I have done, can make a difference, a little bit of difference to that situation, to that interaction, that makes them happier, makes them proud, makes me proud. Uh, those things, I find, have a, a disproportionate impact on me. Obviously, my family, my <coughs> daughters, um, you know, uh, they, they, they motivate you. Um, this community motivates me too, to be honest. This interaction, uh, I know it's meant to be the other way around, but it will motivate me. Saima Hussain, a medical student. Saima Hussain. Um, my question to you would be, um, what has been your biggest obstacle throughout your career so far and how did you overcome that obstacle? My biggest ob obstacle uh, to my career progress is me. Uh, it has to be me. Um, if I could be better at my job, if I could be cleverer, maybe I could go even further. I mean, this is not to say it's, it's not all my fault, but <laughs> what I'm saying, the biggest, biggest, um, uh, the biggest barrier is usually you. I wasn't a particularly good student at, uh, at science. You know, we have Dr. Rob here, who's a brilliant scientist. But, um, but I did engineering because the thing that motivated me is that I wanted to build electrical power stations everywhere because I thought electricity was the answer to poverty. So if there is a passion, if you have a passion, you really believe it, you're willing to actually put some work into it and not just talk about it. Talk about it also. Talking about it is important because then you, you get committed to it because you're embarrassed to say to people, I didn't do it. 
talk about it, share it, but that won't be enough. Put some energy into it, do it, finish it, and then if it wasn't right, do something else. Thank you very much, Anna Chaudhary. Next question, Azmain Zarif Nirchar, a very young, talented A-level student. Um, Nirchar? During your time in Bangladesh, yeah. you would have... Um, you would have been through the 2006 to 2008 political crisis. I was there from 2004 to 2008. Yes. So, yeah, in, in that time, um, how do you think domestic political crises, how do you think they affect foreign diplomatic relationships? And especially against a background of corruption allegations against both party leaders and for both parties during that time. Yeah. Thank you. The job of the diplomat there is to understand so you can't help not getting involved in the sense of understanding deeply what is going in on in the country that is your that is the whole point the government has sent you there so that we can have a deeper better understanding of the country that you're in and but then that some would argue that's a international or uh, Western uh, intervention in the democratic political system in Bangladesh? Well, understanding something is not intervention, it's understanding. Intervention is something that may come later if you uh, intervene. So what is, the, what is the job? The job is to promote the interest of your country, Great Britain, in Bangladesh. As I said to you earlier, uh, we were in the lucky position, we still are, that those interests are mutual. So on trade, on security, fighting extremism, um, on, on cultural issues, on education, on health, on all those issues that you can talk about, the international relationship spectrum. We were not, there wasn't a difference. Um, and it is also your job to say what your country's beliefs and values, your job is to promote those values. Now, if that is anti-corruption, then it is your job as an ambassador to promote that value and, and try and help uh, the place you are in to, um, uh, to achieve more in this, um, in, the, in, in this area. Whatever country you're in, you are forced to deal with the situation that you find. You then look at it as to does it affect our interests and values. If it does, it takes on a special sort of tasking a special role if it doesn't you try you tend not to get so involved but obviously you do get involved because your job is to understand and influence that country and we influence through diplomacy through persuasion uh, but in Bangladesh uh, the the greater threat at that time was um, you know um, was stability and the extremism I mean people have forgotten what happened in 2007 you know we had the first suicide bombings at that time, you know, the, it was really, it was at a cliff. Yeah. Um, and all of that, thank, you know, thanks to the Bangladeshi people, um, the administration at the time, has now receded a little. Uh, and it doesn't have to be like that, you know. You have seen other countries where things have fallen over. It has fallen over the edge. Uh, Bangladesh, I understand, um, is, is doing well economically, you know, obviously it has its challenges. Um, but um, if you're a diplomat, you've got to get involved. Dhanabad Anwar Chaudhuri. Doshok, dekhchen an evening with Anwar Chaudhuri. Amra kotha bolche Anwar Chaudhuri shathe, amadhe shathe kotha bolche na amadhe aachkeer. Othiti bhinindho jara bhinindho jayegar theke, bhinindho profession theke, aachkeer ee onushtanet jyuk diye chen. Onushtanet ee porjaya jabo chhottu ekti bhiroti te, amadhe shongye thak. to Lauha Valley, your desired wedding venue and restaurant in the Midlands. With stunning decor and capacity for 900 guests, Lauha Valley provides car parking facilities, separate bridal room, prayer facilities and many more. We also run a 100 seating buffet restaurant seven days a week with more than 40 items. To book, please call us on 01922. 637 Valley in Warsaw, your 
ব্রিটিশ সিটিজেনশিপ পাওয়ার সুযোগ রয়েছে এই আইনের অধীনে যাদের অ্যাপ্লিকেশন সফল হবে তাদের পরিবারের সদস্যদের লিভ টু রিমেন অ্যাপ্লিকেশন করার সুযোগ রয়েছে বর্তমান আইন পরিবর্তন হওয়ার আগে আমাদের সাথে সরাসরি যোগাযোগ করুন Charles Simmons Immigration Solicitor call 0208 514 000 Hello Pacer International Money Transfers Instead of waiting days transfer your money without delays It's fast cheap and secure You can now send money to your friends and family in Bangladesh for free All you need to do is visit hellopacer.co.uk and register Select the country you want to send your money to Choose your recipient And finally select your preferred payout method for absolutely no service fees Hello Pacer International Money Transfers London Bashider Priyo Priyo Bazare ekhon theke pacchen quick transported Bangladeshi fresh fish ar Monday to Friday takche free home delivery only in Tower Hamlet area Priyo Bazare royeche dedicated product specialist for fish vegetables and meat section Priyo Bazare ashun ar mon bhore shopping korun সারা সপ্তাহ জুড়ে নানা ফিস আইটেম থাকছে বাই ওয়ান গেট ওয়ান ফ্রি সে প্রিয় বাজার ওই বিলিভ ইন কোয়ালিটি অ্যান্ড সার্ভিস প্রিয় বাজারে রয়েছে নিজস্ব কার পার্কিং প্রিয় বাজার ওয়াটনি মার্কেট শেডুয়েল লন্ডন The Royal Regency, an exclusive event venue in East London. Sitting capacity for more than a thousand guests. Your desired venue for wedding, conference and corporate or family events. Providing car parking facilities, spacious hall and splendid decoration. The Royal Regency, 501 High Street North, Manor Park, London, E12. Royal Regency, meet and greet in a luxurious, spacious place. সবাইকে স্বাগত জানাচ্ছি বিরতির পর এনিভিনিং উইথ আনোয়ার চৌধুরী অনুষ্ঠানে আমরা কথা বলছি আনোয়ার চৌধুরীর সাথে এবারে শুনবো অনুষ্ঠানের এই পর্যায়ে আমাদের বাকি অতিথিদের বক্তব্য নেক্সট মিস্টার মাহবুব নূর সেক্রেটারি জেনারেল ডাব্লিউ বিসিসি এন্ড হি হ্যাজ কাম ফ্রম অল দ্য ওয়ে ফ্রম ওয়েলস মাই কোশ্চেন ইজ बेस्ड অন মাই ব্যাকগ্রাউন্ড হুইচ ইজ হুইচ ইজ বিজনেস এন্ড ইকোনমি নাও দ্যাট দ্য ইউকে ইজ ডেফিনেটলি লিভিং এন্ড देयर इज नॉट गोइंग टू बी अ সেকেন্ড রেফারেন্ডাম উই লিভিং ইউরোপ Do the Bangladeshi diaspora have a role to play uh, between UK Bangladesh uh, relationship in terms of building a trade relationships and what do you think a country a growing economy like Bangladesh has to offer to the UK or does it have something to, something to offer to the UK and if so how it can uh, benefit both parties we are not the diaspora we are Brits okay all right so it's, it's really important this we are Brits okay we have this connection with Bangladesh lots of challenges on Brexit but i'm quite confident that this country will do well and it will do it through what you mentioned through trade we were our history is of a trading country as how all this started okay this is what we do okay <coughs> we will find ourselves um not just open to trade with the rest of the world including bangladesh but we have to trade with the rest of the world of necessity okay and i think that will eventually eventually make our economy stronger more competitive and we'll do well we'll do well the reason why i say all this and sometimes i joke with it um uh with with some colleagues if you look at today's world you can contribute almost 90% of it to our country whether it's the steam engine the worldwide web capitalism you know uh dna s- structure theory of evolution you know it doesn't matter newton with laws of gravity you know whatever wherever you look you see the contribution that this country has made to science to the legal system to all that so this is this is not a small place it's full of talented people within 48 hours of the brexit decision we had 
countries in South America phoning the other ambassadors saying, can we do a free trade agreement with you straight away? Within 48 hours. Okay. And that is not an exceptional case. We have, I can't go into the exact numbers, but they're certainly in double figures and more. Countries waiting to do these free trade deals. That opens up opportunities for Bangladesh, opens up opportunities for us, op opportunities for you as people who understand both countries to make that and to invent that business. You have to invent new businesses. We have an advantage. We understand both places. We can get business done. In fact, this country re relies on you to strengthen that relationship because you have that unique, uh, unique understanding. On Brexit, I think, not to be complacent, but this is Great Britain, and still the greatest times are still ahead of us if we, if we collectively get our minds together and get the leadership to see us through. Nazim Uddin, Ajahn Babshai, and Akishat Ajahn Academy. Nazim Uddin. I want to ask a, a question uh, to you. Uh, how have you developed the mindset to reach to the pinnacle of the British diplomatic service? I think we covered it a little bit by realizing that there is something you can always learn by being attentive, try to listen to and try and understand the environment you're in, having some confidence, genuine confidence and pride in who you are. I never, you know, my profession, my institution, is full of people who've had a better education than me, I suspect, went to better institution, Oxbridge, Eton, you know. But it never fazed me because of some of the exposure I had. I knew that they may have some advantages, but I have others, okay? So knowing who I am, being proud of who I am, having the presence of mind to learn from what you see from different cultures, and not letting the bad times destroy you. You have to survive the dip, okay? That's the only difference between very successful people and less successful people, is what they do when they're down there. Sanwar Choudhury, I'm the Arakjan Muk, Arakjan entrepreneur and social activist, Sanwar Choudhury. I want to ask you something slightly different. Um, Yugoslavia used to be one country uh, a few years back. Um, Myanmar, a country where the Rohingyas lived more than 300 years as citizens, as uh, Myanmar or Burmese. Um, do you ever see a situation like that repeating itself in Europe, especially uh, in a country like the United Kingdom um, going forward? Is that something that we need to worry about? I, I mean, <laughs> what I wanted to say is no straight away. Uh, because that, that's what I actually think. The reason why I pause is because of the history of our civilizations, you know, of, of the human history. It seems to repeat itself when we think we've learned the lesson for the last time, that we've got over hatred, we've got over a challenge, and that learning uh, stays with you. Um, but as you know, uh, Dr. Sanwa, that that is not true. And there's always a small risk. I, I, the answer is no, I don't think so. And that's why I think um, what we can do, do to bring cohesion, to bring harmony, to bring understanding in our society and elsewhere is, is so, so important. And also to speak out. Speak out. As, 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 as it's been said many times, it only takes people to stay quiet for evil to prosper. When you see wrong, even if it is hurtful to your own uh, self or community or whatever it is, speak out, say no, show disapproval. I think that, that those things are, are very important. Dewan Mahdi, a solicitor and also a television presenter. Uh, why uh, Western diplomacy has failed uh, wherever uh, they intervene, like Iraq, um, Afghanistan, uh, or Libya, or any other countries? Uh, what are your thoughts around this? And this is your easy question, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you didn't ask me a difficult one. What are my thoughts on wh where does Western diplomacy uh, fail? Well, you know, there's the acid test in diplomacy failing is that it's when we end up in war. 
That is essentially the outcome, the acid test for my profession failing. We can't always save everything by talking because the other side doesn't want to talk, so it's not always possible. But essentially, so if we have ended up in, in, in conflicts that's been costly, you can't say that's a successful diplomacy. Um, we have contributed in, and you don't hear of it because nobody hears of this thing that the, the war didn't happen, that didn't happen because of diplomacy. It's never talked about because it didn't happen, so what's the interest? So you hear the, the other side, and, and I would say that if you're serious in this job, you learn from what may have been not the best option um, given the outcome. I think you constantly learn uh, from those, as we have learned from the events that have happened in, in, in Iraq. Afghanistan is still in the situation that it is, it is in. We have a system in our um, in the civil service, in the diplomatic service, where we put up advice, giving lots of options, having done the analysis. It's up to our, our ministers, uh, up to the government, then to take the decision. Do you believe in conspiracy theories, Anand Chaudhary? No, I don't. You don't? No, so I what don't. What are conspiracy theories? I mean, we... I, I, I don't believe... For example, 9-11, we always hear about conspiracy theories, and uh, ISIS, it's another conspiracy theory. So do you believe in those? No. Okay, so do you? What are th I mean, do you have any other term in diplomacy of those conspiracy theories? They, they're usually called nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's bizarre, isn't okay. it? I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, but it, it is interesting. I mean, what is fascinating and perhaps worrying is that so many people seem to give credibility mm -hmm. to what is manifestly, you know, nonsense. Um, and so I'm not a huge conspiracy. Mm. This is not to say that everything you see or hear from government X or government Y or is, is true. This is not the same thing. Okay. But to wildly sort of make up something and, and just put it out there. And then given the media we have with Facebook, with Instagram, with Twitter and whatever else, you know, this, the, 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 the modern term now is, of course, fake news. It's so easy to create this thing. I try to look at the evidence. Okay, I have to, it's the only sensible way you can evaluate anything. I think the problem, one of the problems with conspiracy theories, isn't there? this is just hypothesizing, I don't know the answer. I think some people like them because it gives them a sense of power over a situation. We don't understand a situation, we create a conspiracy, then we seem to have sort of gripped it. It's a lazy way of gripping it. Anam Choudhury. Anam Choudhury, um, he is a chief executive officer for Sandwell. Question to you, sir, is in regards to institutional racism. Yes. Uh, you mentioned earlier yes. about social racism that you may yes. have faced, but yes. have you faced uh, in institutional racism uh, within your career? You know, I was so thick-skinned. Um, I was, and this is, it probably helps to be a little bit thick-skinned sometimes. I didn't know when I was actually dealing with institutional racism because I was so busy trying to do the best job I can. And I've been through some really conservative institutions. We know it exists. It's been proven by many people it exists. My advice to you is to ignore it, not to deny it. That's totally different, okay? Not to deny it but to ignore it and focus on the thing that you can change. And you'll find some of this actually gets blown away. Um, but if you allow it to interfere with you, it will have a growing impact on how you behave and it will stop you bringing out the best in you. Kamarul Islam? My question to you would be, it's a frequent perception within the British Bangladeshi young generation that they don't want to work for Bangladeshi employers. Perhaps a various reason could be, one may say, could be the payment, uh, wages, salary, or not treated fairly, whatever the reason is. Right. As a result, we have got a very few British Bangladeshi corporate companies thriving um, as opposed to the Western counterpart. Yeah. Now, with the role that you're involved in, the position that you hold, what influence can you bring to change this perception within the young British Bangladeshi generation? I would say simply this, uh, if you are an entrepreneur as you are, uh, and 
opening up a company or operate a company, why take on just Bangladeshis? Take on anybody who is the best qualified. You owe it to your company and yourself and to your country to do that. That's fair. Why, why, why discriminate against uh, somebody else? Uh, equally, as we would expect, a company run by an Englishman to take me on or take you on without discrimination. Um, so that's what I would urge you. For us to think of us, as I said, this is our country. We are British people of Bangladeshi origin. So I think that's worthwhile remembering. And, and then I would do all the things that you say are the problems, uh, you know, to counter those things. You know, pay people more, treat them more fairly if they are the problems. And show what a great thing it is to work for a company owned by a Bangladeshi entrepreneur. Because they're, I understand, from, at least from the restaurant trade, if I may just give uh, from things I hear, that a lot of um, people, you know, uh, Eastern European uh, uh, immigrants who work for Bangladeshi restaurants, really enjoy the experience. Say Bangladeshis are good employers. <coughs> it's a great place to work. You know, it's a lovely family orientation. And that's, that's what I hear, OK? That can be the case for whether we're running a software company, whether we're running an accountancy, whether we're running a trading firm. It can be the case anywhere. So this is the, this is the role. I mean, how many, what are we, about There's around half a million British Bangladeshis? Yes. Or maybe a little bit more. We all have this ambassador role for ourselves and for our community and for our country. Right? So I, and sometimes it occurs to me that here's a situation where I can do something that reflects well on, from, on the background I come from. Next question, uh, Muhammad Shahan Al-Haq, A-level student. Muhammad Shahan Al-Haq. My question is, what advice would you give to us young generation, British Bangladeshis, and the pivotal role we should play in society? Be ambitious. Don't let limitations and myths curtail that ambition. That's a tragedy. You must not do that. Get exposure, okay? Seek out contacts, seek out opportunities to experience different things. Don't be afraid of getting it wrong, okay? People forget. Study hard, enjoy life too. And follow your ambition and good luck to you. Maruf Hassan, an accountant and the former consultant to the Prime Minister Office of Bangladesh. Maruf Hassan. Uh, my question is, uh, being a, a former British High Commissioner in Bangladesh, uh, how you actually um, value Bangladesh prospects in future and is there any weaknesses? And also, uh, how uh, uh, the professionals of Bangladesh, young professionals, can get some skills on diplomacy and trade so that they can present Bangladesh in a better way uh, with the other countries? First of all, the last question first. Uh, Bangladeshis, I meet them all around the world, you know, even in Lima, in, 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 um, in China, in, um, uh, in Germany, in Spain. I meet them everywhere. Believe it or not, Bangladeshis are liked everywhere. It's, it's absolutely true. I, I know this because I, I've been to those places. So you, Bangladesh does not have an image problem with its people. People love Bangladesh elsewhere. My um, thing has always been the, the two things that has helped accelerate development is education and infrastructure. Focus on those things. There is an over-focus, believe it or not, on politics. Okay? Obviously, good politics, good governance, um, clear strategy, all of that helps. Absolutely no denying that. That'll get, but focus on practical things. I and mean, Bangladesh is already a very different country to what it was in the 70s and 80s. It's still growing at 6%. I believe the infrastructure is improving. All of those things are going the right way. But there are dangers that it needs to fight and make sure it doesn't fall into. Extremism is probably the most clear present danger it faces and, and maintaining democracy and strengthening democracy um, is uh, something that it always needs to be vigilant on. Uh, Razak Amin, a businessman and entrepreneur. Razak Amin. I do believe I'm British. I've got four children, alhamdulillah. Yeah. And that was my son on the front row. Oh, now, <laughs> I tried to integrate them in the British way of life yeah. as a Bangladeshi. But I still hold a Bangladeshi passport. What yeah. would you say to that? 
Well, you're a dual citizen, that is what I would say to that. <laughs> I haven't applied uh, for a British passport. <laughs> well, you see, there, it's very clear, you are a Bangladeshi citizen living in Britain. That is not the situation for the rest of, I think, most of the crowd here, if not all of them. Uh, the, the other situation is when you're born here, you're a British passport holder, this is your country, um, obviously you have the strong linkages. So if you're a Bangladeshi passport holder, and Bangladeshi passport holder, then you're obviously a Bangladeshi living in the UK, then there's no contradiction in what you're saying. But I hope one day you will join us and become a British Bangladeshi soon. Thank yeah, you thank very you. much. Dr. Ruabuddin. <laughs> Dr. Ruabuddin, next question, please. I would like you to cite an example of a failure of some heavy uh, gravity which you have overcome, how you have overcome, and what have you learned from it? Actually, a very good question, but a difficult question. <laughs> um, the reason is this is because I don't, by nature, overfocus or spend too much time. On, on failures. I think one of the things we need to do is learn from your failure and, and move on quickly. So, and there have been many I can, I, I can think of. Sometimes I wonder whether I'm being the best father I can be um, to, the, to my children. Sometimes I wonder whether I can be the best son or brother. So there are personal things that sometimes in a reflective moment that uh, makes me wonder. I sometimes wonder what I have failed to achieve that I was probably capable of and because of the lack of clarity, intelligence um, that I, I, I missed out on. You sometimes wonder whether was there anything that I could have done to avoid the terrorist attack that killed and injured so many uh, people. People who are wise they say to you that it is the failures in relationships in your personal life, in your family life, the relationship with your son, your daughter, your father, whatever, it is those things that you think about most, those failures you think about most when you're on your, in your last days. It's never that I didn't work too hard, um, you know, I failed to work or get that promotion. I think very few people think about those things. And I wonder if that is the case, uh, uh, case with me. Um, we, we don't know. But it is a, a deep question, I think, to which I think you continue to reflect and learn. Ibrahim Mia. Um, next question from Ibrahim Mia, please. First one, uh, as a Muslim, yes. you have a duty towards a Palestinian. And I believe you'll be taking your post from uh, March uh, 2018. So uh, as a leader, do you, do you intend to speak up for Palestinians? As you know, they, uh, they live in the prison camp and also uh, British government supplying the web firearms. Are you intend to speak up for them? And my second question is boys watching, so you better be careful. If, if Bangladesh were to play Ireland 2019 World Cup, who are you going to be supporting? Uh, obviously, I, um, I support, uh, support England. Uh, uh, but if it's um, if it's Bangladesh versus any other country apart from England, it's Bangladesh. Okay, okay. absolutely no doubt. And it, and and I think we are going to be. I think we are doing great. And your other question, um, the as a diplomat, my job is uh, is not politics. Okay, and I work through giving advice uh, to to ministers and trying to influence uh, policy. I am a Muslim, I am also a father, I am a diplomat, I am a Brit, I am many, many things, okay? So I think it's important that we look at that in a, in a, in a, in a, in a balanced way. My job is very clear, uh, which is to promote diplomatically some of, the, um, some of the ends that we want as a country. And as you know, we are a very strong supporter of the two-state solution in Palestine. We have, been, we have been promoting and supporting that very strongly. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Dr. A.K. Rahman, Principal Mechanical uh, uh, Analysis Engineer, Structural Integrity BAE Systems. Dr. A.K. Rahman? I am an engineer and I'm, um, yeah. I've been an engineer for over 20 years working yeah. for BAE Systems. Yeah. I know you qualified as an engineer. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to ask you is how did you really then change your career to become a diplomat, the, 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 the steps that, that you went through? 
the short answer is that I was pretty rubbish as an engineer. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's, let's start from there. I've actually worked for BAE Systems. I worked for Plessy uh, Systems, Plessy Radar, for five years. And as, uh, as luck would have it, I progressed very quickly, not because I was any good at engineering, but I was, I was quite good at managing teams and issues, so I, I, I wrote. Managing the engineers. <laughs> Yeah, who were much smarter than me, you know, and, and mathematicians and, and so on. And I increasingly realized that my talents, if I have any, lie in policy and in management and things. So the career naturally started going that way, and people started recruiting me in, into, into those roles. As I, and I became clearer that, because when you do a degree, this is what I said to this young man, sometimes when you do a degree, you think you must be your degree all your life. So I had this big problem. I studied engineering, I got to be an engineer all the way until I retire, otherwise I failed, right? Because I didn't make it. So that, I, I became more, I dealt with it. And then we, um, and then the opportunities came quite quickly as I proved myself in policy and in general management. And I got recruited by, you know, people asked me to join MOD Centre, then the Cabinet Office, then the Foreign Office. But some of that comes because you expose yourself to the right places, and you, you do well, and then your reputation kind of... So it happened half and half. Half I pushed it, and half I got pulled. Thank you very yeah. much. I mean, uh, Amadir Duti Proshno Ishche, Jara Atkir Eyonustane Ashte Parani. The question is, the, did you ever feel that you were going to do wrong thing or forced to go ahead with the wrong decision being made because you were serving Her Majesty's government. So did you, make, did you make any decision that you didn't like? You always um, make, not decisions, but you, you can be very um, easily in positions where a policy is being carried out which wasn't exactly your opinion. But that is the beauty of our uh, service and our system of government. Different options and things will go to the minister, they will be discussed at the officials level and people will have different views. But once you have decided that this is going to be HMG policy, in our system of government you defend it, you do not express your private view. And the another question asked by uh, another lady who couldn't attend uh, yeah. tonight, um, are there any s unspoken laws of diplomacy? I've spoken loads of... So you say things, but you actually don't do those things. I think that would be a very bad diplomat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because the, the whole um, concept on which diplomacy works is that you can trust the word, you have to trust the word of the diplomat. Because I represent UK. If I go and say to a foreign government, the British government is going to do this, that has to be an unbreakable thing. Okay? That has to be true. The, there's a subtler variation on this. So we as diplomats, we don't. I don't know any diplomat who would lie. Not li it's not our culture. But you don't have to say everything. That's the difference. Okay? I don't have to always answer. I, you ask me a question. If I find myself in a position where I'm going to have to lie, my position would be not to answer that question. So I haven't lied to you. Diplomacy, best diplomacy works on trust, that you have to be able to trust what I'm saying to you is true. If I haven't said anything, then you are free to assume whatever you like. There's probably a reason why I haven't said anything. Anna Shouzuri, I'm going to say that you're 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 going to say that It's difficult for me to talk to you because I'm part of you. I see myself as part of you. What do I want? I want you all to succeed fabulously in whatever you are doing and wish you the very best of luck and every success in your future. Ashanko Dhanrabad. Ashanko Dhanrabad, you can see your friends in the next few days. Yes. You can see your friends in the British Bangladeshi community. You can see your friends in the next few days. जार जार क्षेत्र सफल है असंख्य धन्यवाद थैंक यू वेरी मच इंडिड दर्शक सबाई को असंख्य धन्यवाद विशेषकर धन्यवाद आज के अनुष्ठने अपना जरा अतिथि हिसाब से लंडन और लंडनर बहरे के शुद्ध वेल्स अतिथि आसान बार्मिंगम आसान लुडन आसान अने के आज के संग दिए एत रत पर्त हाई हिटेड टेम्पारेचारे स्टूडियो स्टूडियो सबाई 
আমাদেরকে সময় দিয়েছেন এজন্য আপনাকে আপনাদের অসংখ্য ধন্যবাদ দর্শক আপনাদেরকে অসংখ্য ধন্যবাদ দীর্ঘক্ষণ ধরে এবং প্রয়োজনীয় একটি অনুষ্ঠান আপনারা দেখেছেন অত্যন্ত আমরা অত্যন্ত গর্বিত এবং একই সাথে আমরা আনন্দিত জনাব আনোয়ার চৌধুরী ডেজিগনেট গভর্নর ফর ক্যামেন আইল্যান্ড তিনি আমাদেরকে সময় দিয়েছেন দর্শকদের জন্য আমাদের কমিউনিটির জন্য তিনি আজকে সময় দিয়েছেন তার ব্যস্ততম পারিবারিক এবং রাষ্ট্রীয় যেসব দায়িত্ব রয়েছে সেইগুলির আলোকে সেই সময় সেখান থেকে সময় বের করে তিনি আমাদেরকে সময় দিয়েছেন আমরা প্রত্যাশা করি একজন আনোয়ার চৌধুরী নয় আমাদের কমিউনিটিতে আরও আনোয়ার চৌধুরীর জন্ম হবে এবং আজকে যাদেরকে নিয়ে আমরা অনুষ্ঠান করেছি ভবিষ্যতে আগামী কয়েক বছরের মধ্যে এদের সবাইকে নিয়ে আমরা আনোয়ার চৌধুরীর মতো এই এখানে চ্যানেলে সে অনুষ্ঠান করতে পারবো এবং সেই দিনের প্রত্যাশা নিয়ে আজকের মতো অনুষ্ঠান এখানে শেষ করছি সবাই ভালো থাকবে শুভ সন্ধ্যা